done these in a little bit of uh, uh, time. So we wanted to kind of get back on a monthly cadence. And what better way to start it with a, a, a pair of working cinematographers? Um, in, uh, on your screen is Yasek Laskas. He's an ASC member who has a wild variation of, of films that he's shot for in his in his history we're going to talk a bunch about those as well as a, a, a current project that he's worked on and he's worked on that with jack mcdonald who has uh, who's helmed the dp position on the pro on the project um that's called picnic and a little mutiny and more on that coming up so welcome gentlemen uh, to this chat thank you thank you tony it's a really great being here and thank you zeiss for organizing it you know, so we really appreciate this. Our pleasure. So Yasek and Jack, I, I, we were just talking, you two are, are LA based, um, uh, you know, neighbors just about. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so the working relationship there is is probably is very tight. Yasek, I wanted to kind of start, you've been in the business for, for quite some time, going all the way back to even films like uh, I was looking, New Jack City, um, you know, where you were, we were second, um, second unit uh, DP. Um, and just a, a wide variety of different looks and different ways that you approach cinematography. And I kind of wanted to touch on that, um, you know, because being having such a variation of projects in your background, what is your, how do you approach every new project? What is it that you look for in, in, in a project that you're with? And how do you um, artistically go towards defining the look of that project? I think it's mostly intuitive you know rather than intellectual uh, and you know it comes from uh, um, a script and a conversation with the director as always and uh, trying to figure out how the director sees uh, the film sees the character sees the location all that what are his or her references and then of course you bring your own and um, I think the visual style of each film, you know, should be a little different because each story is a little different. And I think the style helps the characters, helps the milieu, the, the environment, you know, to be much more authentic and specific to the story rather than kind of a generic um, that is your look. It's, I feel that that's somehow and sometimes beneficial to the project, but not necessarily beneficial to uh, your career because people don't really know what your style is. And um, that's kind of um, could be, um, you know, kind of confusing to the future project, to the people that you're going to work with until you explain to them that you know, I'm here for your project and I'm going to develop a specific look for that. I'm not bringing my own just style there. Uh, so I think that's the best way to describe it. So it's really a collaborative art for you, um, you know, working with the, uh, the director and the rest of the design team. Yeah, I mean, it starts with a conversation, of course, you know, it's like why why did you choose me to work on that project? What was the reason why you want my uh, vision, my collaborative spirit, you know, my ideas to help your project? So that's one of the things. And then to try and understand what they really mean by that. Because the words are one thing and then the images might be different. Colorful for me might be one thing for director might be another thing. Many times happens that, you know, I would hear that we want this film to be dark. And uh, then it was a question, not that dark. So, <laughs> you know. We, we've all seen recently in, in some of the episodics on, uh, shall we say HBO, where that, that, that has been a, a strong topic of discussion is what is the definition of dark? <laughs> yes. Exactly. Good to get that known up front. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the most memorable moment, uh, inspir there are a couple of inspirational moments that I can recall uh, when I started the project. One was with uh, Michael Tolkien, who wrote and was going to direct an episode for um, 
American sci-fi sci stories. And um, he, my agent, I think, sent them my reel. They like my reel. I met with him at his house, at his office. And I knew I had a job because of the way the energy was, you know, by me being uh, already invited. So that made the conversation kind of more at ease. And in the end, I asked what, so Michael, how do you see your, that film? And he picked up two postcards. One was the empty kind of concrete space. And another one was of the Rocco Kolak, a very Baroque chair. And he said, that's how I see my film. Hmm. And then it was up to me to put, put this images together and figure out what he really means. But what I liked about it, that he gave me the sense of energy that he wanted to convey through images. He wasn't specific, you know, to images from another movies. And I appreciated that because it allowed me to kind of expand my imagination and say, okay, so this is a story that takes place in a very um, kind of empty space. And that empty space could have been not only the space itself, but the emotional space. And then it is abundance with uh, um, glut, you know, that the, the, the chair was uh, representing for me. And it was a sci-fi story about people who were so rich, they didn't know what to do with the money. Right. They were trying to buy robots, you know, who would do things for them. And then, of course, there is a twist, which I won't go into. <laughs> but um, that environment was this emptiness uh, of characters and, you know, and the space and, uh, and then also plenty of uh, plentiful of, you know, of possession and, and richness. The other one was an interesting conversation where it described um, that was with Jeremy Kagan. And this was kind of strange differently because it was on a series, The Guardian. And sometimes, you know, when you go through episodes, the directors come in, they watch your work your previous week, then um, they come in and they do minor uh, tweaking. And Jeremy said, well, I would like for this episode to each take have no beginning and no end. And that was kind of another challenge. Yeah. Because then I had to imagine of what would happen, what would be before we start the camera and what would be after we cut. So there was that what we actually filmed was had the beginnings somewhere and the end somewhere that didn't we didn't film. Wow, that that's even more challenging because you need to and you need to leave them open ended for the audience to decide. Yeah, so that kind of changed the energy of the camera motion. Okay. You know, the movement for us. How, did, how so? Did you see it, it slowing down to allow or you know? Or? It's again, it's a hard to describe as anything you know, any personal uh, contribution, it's really hard to say what makes certain things, you know, uh, a contribution of another person. But I felt that I would imagine in my mind that shot already being somewhere. And then I started picking it up basically, mm -hmm. you know, so like if the characters would be somewhere else, I would follow him, but then I really pick him up over here. Wow. Okay. So, um, I I like your comment of the the director bringing you imagery to 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 build off of. Do you find that that that's a, a good choice for you in the conversation as well to kind of go not not necessarily to another movie but more towards fine art or some type of photographic imagery that that could best typify how you want to bring yourself to the film. Yeah, I mean, I prefer actually uh, fine art and photographs to movies, mm -hmm. definitely. And there's another thing which I've been doing 
especially when I lived in New York in the beginning of my career, and uh, I would be offered a project. And it was my part of preparation to go to the Museum of Modern Art. And they have, of course, the permanent collection. And I had my favorite uh, paintings in that collection that I would love to revisit. But every project would bring me to different imagery. And I was kind of surprised that at some point I would be looking at Cezanne and saying that responds to me as a palette, for example, for the picture. But then I would be going to the Curical on another one and standing there and saying, this responds to me for this project. And the emotional connection to those images is something that you know you kind of uh, um, digest and it stays with you. So when you start being on a set, the communication then is simpler because you're focused on a certain energy in the picture. So that energy at that moment is then either understood or tweaked, you know, or approved a bit that there's a, the level of conversation, the boundaries of a conversation, I think much, much narrower because you're already heading into on the same track, in the same direction. Wonderful. Um, so, so you've, you, once you get to that point where, um, you know, uh, do you see generally that, or do you try to focus generally on the, on a character arc um, as your main motivation, what, bringing those styles to the production, or is it more the overall arc of the, of the, of the film itself? I Which think is more important? Combination, but most, mostly probably a character arc is more kind of important to me, especially if, I mean with framing and with you know with the uh, uh, space around it, the character and the tonality because tonality lighting wise of the film should be mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, consistent in some ways unless there is a specific sequence that requires you know kind of deviation from that uh, style but the framing with frames you have a little better and more flexibility and then how you frame the characters when you know depending on the arc of that character if it's a tighter shot if it's a lower shot if it's a wider lens and you know it's Sometimes it's very intuitive and I, I don't know, I mean, Jack knows my way of teaching cinematography because he was a fellow at AFI. So I, I try to kind of uh, push into intuitive and emotional understanding of image. Yes, do plan it, do talk about it, do you know bring conversation to conversation other images but then when you on a set kind of feel what you're filming and then see if it works because sometimes the change of lens will bring the performance to a better uh, place I totally agreed. So, Jack, um, to you for a little bit. You guys met at AFI. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was a cinematography fellow, class of 2020, and and Yatsik taught the hands-on lighting and and um, film, and and uh, we we got to shoot 35 millimeter every week and and nice. watch a print of it the next week. Um, yeah, it was a very special class that he taught and still teaches. Wonderful. So as, as in that kind of mentor mentee relationship, what, what kinds of things did you look for? What kinds of things did you feel were most important to, to learn from Yasek? Um, in the making of this film or more general? in general? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm headed there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not to jump ahead. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> Yasek of course has a, a wealth of, of knowledge and um, you know, he understands the, 
the artistic side and the, the technical side and the collaborative side and and there's so many things to to latch on to and uh yeah it, it was it was great to take it to the next level because i was like a you know a, a little one-on-one -on -one, um master class in in a lot of ways wonderful so yeah uh Yasek, you had mentioned um in this new piece that you put together picnic and a little mutiny um that you started there you of course uh took on the director's role um and jack was the cinematographer on this film that's correct yes um so and you were saying that it that's exactly how you started the the conversation was with some of those images that um uh, that you had hoped to bring to life to 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 drive the the drama along yeah well you know there there are two films there were two films that uh, we talked about that and um, one was a uh, knife in the water because the film takes place on a boat mm -hmm. on the water and uh, uh, what i love the about that uh, film is the deep focus wide angle lenses multiple kind of layers of information and uh, very stylized, you know, um, way of shooting, um, never handheld, mostly, uh, I mean, all the time from the tripod set frames and so on. And the second one was La Ventura, uh, which um, I'm, maybe I'm going to share two images. Uh, yeah, please do. From... Uh, uh, from Knife in the Water, for me, this was a, um, a pivotal image. But, you know, there were images also like that. Or uh, like that. Or like that. You know, uh, images that are definitely wide angle lenses, definitely deep focus and very composed. Uh, from the La Ventura, it was mostly um, pacing, but there was a one beautiful image, which is this one, that I really, really loved. And then there was another one that actually Jack remembered and helped you know, create the ending of the film, which is this one. Uh, because as part of the film takes place on the island, but we wanted to have a water always present in the background, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a reminder where we are. So those images and those two films probably were the most kind of influential for that. And, um, um, I know Jack responded quite well to both of those suggestions and, uh, you know, and actually uh, develop his own interpretation of that, you know, so it was really very uh, wonderful. And I, the, the one thing I have to say to start with that um, when we had a conversation, the first conversation about the film, uh, it was, I told you, Jack, you know, forget that I was your uh, mentor, forget that I am cinematographer and a member of AC. That's not my job right now. It, no pressure. And, you know, just do your job and I'll be very happy. Yeah, easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine yeah so 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 jack um uh, as the director yasek has has presented you with these images how do you in, how do you interpret that how do you build that into not only the emotion that he wants to capture on screen but also the the practical nature of of lighting and and framing sure yeah and, and i i appreciated um the the specific images that the yasek highlighted like the the image of the feet running over the water which is like you know it's not a direct image that that we were going to replicate is is more of of like a a feeling and and it's more of a poetic reference. And then the 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 second image that really stands out to me is one that you didn't show, which is a which was a from La Ventura, but it was a slow pan a wide shot of a group of characters walking along the rocks, I believe. And do you have that one, Yantic? 
I think I do. Yeah, let me uh, see where. Uh, Which that that reference like gave me a, a load of insight on like what the character of the camera was and like how how the camera. This used. one. Uh, let me yeah. just share this. Okay. Is that still on, Jack? Um, I'm not seeing the, I'm seeing just the play bar for some reason. Yeah, it looks like you just grabbed a, a, a small section. It's like maybe selected just the play bar on the bottom. Yeah, it's like we're not seeing the image itself. I couldn't hear you. Um, we're, we're not seeing the image itself. We're just seeing the, the play bar for some reason. Um, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah uh, unfortunate. I mean, I can try to, let me see. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's try again, share. Ah, there we go. That's filmed off TV, so that's. I think mostly you're talking about the, when Monica Pitti is walking right now. Yeah. That's that part. Yeah, so there's like a, you know, a a looseness but a, a composed nature to it and and that the, the camera is is you know evocatively drifting you know and 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 it creates a, a like an interesting combination between something that's naturalistic but but evoking something a little bit more um dreamlike and um and i you know in, into that dreamlike nature like that that image of of the woman laying with the with the water behind it's like these are things that that we talked about a lot in, in pre-production and it's like well i don't know where that fits but it's like something that's deeply ingrained in like how we want the, the film to turn out and uh so then you know we'll we'll get into probably the the story of, of the inspiration for the end but um you know it, it's it's like that ha having that that those discussions ahead of time knowing that it's like I have an image that's just popped into my head that is in the world of of the film that we're we're together trying to make, and it, it's like oh you know Yatsik said it very well about the you know the the conversations in the, in pre production and 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 I think that was really important for us. So you can really start to see um you you know how that translated um, to to the actual film that that you that you you started together. Um, you know, you can start to see just from that pan right there in the opening scene, how you're, you're getting that drift nature of, of, uh, and setting really the emotion that you had talked about. So from, from static images to conversation, to actual application, we can see here how, how all that came together and really starts to make sense in the, in the, in the presentation of the film Picnic and Little Mutiny. Yeah, and I think it's you know it's important to to also bring in the conversations that we had about you know filming characters who are blind, you know people who who are blind, and and uh, you know where there's there's a bunch of different ways you could lean in, in, into like representing that, and and you know like I've seen a lot of examples of very shallow focus and and blurry smeared backgrounds and like tilt focus lenses and stuff like that, but. You know, when when there was, we were talking, you know, Yatsik was like, it's all about the sound and, and the, the th three dimensional space. He's, you know, he, we had this whole plan to have microphones all over the boat and creating a 3D space. And, and you know, it, it, it led to, you know, this like going in the opposite direction of, you know, like sh showing the, the world in, in, in great. Yeah, it's almost, yeah. almost was, uh, I, I remember saying to Jack when, you know, if you hear something and it feels important, pan to it. Like, uh, just be that person who is blind, who hears something, and then kind of turns themselves towards where it is to try to learn more about what's happening. You right. know, so, but don't rush. You know, the the part of the 
film, you know, I mean, uh, Tony, you said that you are a sailor, you know, mm. that um, time on the sailboat extends, floats. Yeah. It right? does, absolutely, and, yeah. It... Uh, there's very few times that you are actually rush. So to be respectful to that energy of journey on a boat, on a sailboat, you know, we could not be rushed with pants or cutting or anything like that, because this will be um, kind of counterproductive to the journey that the characters take, you know, on that trip. So for me, this was very important that, you know, the pace of our aventura and the framing of, you know, of from the three dimensional framing, I think combination of both was essential to uh, the atmosphere of this film. Right. No, and, and it, it's interesting, Jack. You you mentioned different ways of showing that that they were blind, and I I appreciated the fact that you you didn't you didn't do anything that way. It yeah. it simply was people on a boat, and the only re, the only way we got that sense, uh, to be honest. And uh, you know, was was not from was was not from the work of the cinematography, but actually the conversations. Otherwise, okay. I never would have known, you know. And and I really, I, I I appreciated that as a design choice because you didn't lead me anywhere. You let me, as the viewer, you know, invite myself in and and have that aha moment, like, oh, this is what I'm watching. You know, now I have to pay attention to other cues, especially the audio or or just you know the the you know, the overall viewing or the warmth of the sun. Uh, and I, you know, that was a, an excellent choice. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so that uh, a lot of that also came out of um, in editing, uh, you know, the, uh, the pacing of it, you know, of course we had, I had structure in mind of, for the movie. Mm. And basically we kind of knew, but what was going to happen but you know just to let you know we threw away the first two days of shooting really they never never reached the screen because we kind of understood that um the boat has to be moving it's much more exciting there were scenes we filmed in the marina of them all boarding and all that stuff that will um, bring the knowledge, the audience will know immediately they were blind. But um, they, are, they, they, they ask me also, say, don't um, make the, us the blind people who can do that. Make us the people who can do this. Oh, by the way, they are blind. And that twist was very important for me because it allows me to discover in my characters the way they see the world, the way they um, adapt to the world, not to really adapt because that's a wrong word. We all adapt to the world, but with their way of seeing and living life, full life, I found that, you know, the blindness was not necessarily the, uh, negative part that was the way they learn about the world okay i, I, I there was there was that i mean they they definitely brought the, there was conversation about their experiences but you can see how they would adapt that to um uh, to the physical nature of sailing um, you know, and, and I, I think that's the, it's those found moments that the that the camera picks up very gently uh, with the gentleman. I forget his name, but he was on the front of the boat and his phone was telling him which way the the, 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 right, the, yeah. the craft was going. <laughs> um, and, and from that, he knew which way your the apparent wind was. And it was just it was it was a polite a, a nice way to again bring us into that world um which we may may or may we, you know often we take for granted and it was yeah. just a nice an, yet another nice way of of the cinematography capturing that small moment that told so much about the environment we were in well you know um i have met with each of them 
several times before we started filming. And we talked about the elements of life when they became blind, if they were sighted before or if they were not sighted at all. And the gentleman uh, if you're talking, uh, Ray, Ray he, yeah. he's 60s, he's a, has had a quite accomplished um, uh, career as a lawyer. And it's very physically active in his 60s. And I asked him about how he sees the world because he was never sighted. So he has no reference to anything. What the window looks like to you. You know, what um, a space, what, how the sailboat looks to you. And he said, well, you know, I have an image in my mind of what the sailboat looks like. But I don't know if it's real, but for me, it's real. And I said, well, you know, uh, Ray, the same thing is with my movie. I have an image of my movie. I don't know if it's real, <laughs> but right now <laughs> it's the image of my movie that I have. You exactly. Know? So we kind of uh, communicated in that way. So um, Jack, uh, as, as you have that, as you're creating that, that intimate environment on the boat, you also take them, we talked about, onto the island. Um, what, is, what was the shift for you as the cinematographer between those two environments? Um, well, I think that the island gave us an opportunity to, to step back and, and, and see things from, from afar, you know, and, and we have some, some very big, you know, wide angle, um, wide shots that, that is, is like a, a really nice shift in the film, I think, from cameras always in, in close proximity. And then now we're, you know. Jack, I'm going to interrupt you because I don't know if we mentioned to the audience that the film is black and white. Sure. Yeah, so that, I think, um, now, you know, they will know it's a beautiful white shot of black and white islands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the the black and white is 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 something that that you know strips down like the 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 visuals to their forms in in, in a lot of ways, and, and something that we we played with uh, while we're uh, on the island is is the the grass and the wind moving through the grass as as like a visual parallel to to the waves and the wind blowing through the sails and all that. So um, yeah, I think it. it was an interesting way of continuing the, the visual language, but but expanding it in, in some ways. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I think I found that that scene that you were talking about, that's almost the direct correlation to uh, one of the one one of your images. My apologies here. There it is. Where he's laying in the grass. So it's just nice shots, but yeah, no, I, it, it, so now there he goes, as we start, as we, as we, as we come full circle, you can see right from the conversation of the initial images, um, through the different shots to where that actually comes up and in, into the, uh, the piece itself. So really a nice translation, uh, translation, you, like you said, Yasek, from what's in your mind to what's now actually become on the screen. If, if you skip a couple more close-ups, then we can talk about the, the so go back, let's go back, let's go back, go back. Uh, uh, no, 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 Pop, uh, just a little bit past that image, and then there will be close-up of the uh, wind, no, forward, forward. Oh, I see what you're saying, forward. yes. Oh, and here, that, that, just after this image, yeah. Yep. <sighs> Let's get it here. Is yeah, that a CNC? Yeah, yeah, that's probably is a good moment to start. That, for example, those kind of images, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know where exactly they're going to be, but we used split diopters on those. Wow. To, okay. To kind of emphasize kind of the details of foreground, but not lose the background, kind of twist the image um, yeah. to, for the image to be more, I would say, tactile. Mm -hmm. 
you know, which uh, is how you feel when you blind, you feel the image with your hands. So, and I, we believe that um, those split diopters will work quite well for somehow interpreting the way the blind, my, our blind characters would see the world, you know, because it's that it, it becomes, you know, tactile. Yep. No, and now that you say it, you can kind of see, I would yep. not have noticed that, but you can see kind of where the, the split is. It's just kind of quiet in the screen there, but yeah, no, that it, it helps us with that. And it also keeps it, um, speaking of that, how did you choose and what did you choose for the, the camera and lens package for this, knowing that you are in cramped spaces as well as um, uh, wide open areas? Yeah, I mean, it, we were shooting on a boat that had a limited number of, of people that could be on board. So, you know, with, with a large group of people in front of the camera, you know, it, it only left enough room for basically Yatsik, myself, a sound person, and one assistant, camera assistant. And, uh, you know, we knew we needed to have something that was, you know, a, a setup that was very easy to manage in that, in, in that scenario. And so we, we ended up going for the Amira, which is a, a, a good camera for an, an operator that doesn't have an assistant right next to them. And we were lucky enough to, to get the, the Zeiss compact zooms, which were perfect for us. We knew that, you know, they, cause, cause you guys at Zeiss have the 15 to 30 and, 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 and we, we got the 15 to 30 and the 28 to 80, but we knew going into it that we were probably going to be shooting almost everything in that 15 to 30 range. I imagine. Yeah. And like, I think there was a few times that we used the, the other lens, but, but it was primarily on, on the, the wide zoom and, but we also wanted a, a zoom that, that, you know, felt like a, we, we weren't getting a zoom to do zoom shots. You know, we, we were getting a zoom that we wanted to feel like a prime lens, you know, a, a set of primes that had the convenience of not having to switch lenses, you know, in, in the, instance of something happening organically in front of the camera because it might right. sit in right there on the hat there he was below deck with the looking at a, a little monitor pulling focus and you know to to move the camera was a whole you know operation but move the change lenses would 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 double that time easily so uh um, I, I hope you kept him with plenty of drama mean as well yeah, I don't know how he did it. <laughs> that, was a, that was a concern, uh, but we didn't have any trouble with with sea sick sickness. Uh, oh, that's the shot. You see, that's uh, yeah, that one of my favorite shots. I'm really happy <laughs> looking at the the images, and the, they seem to be struggling up on the top deck. <laughs> what? So, yeah, so that you know the, the compact. Zooms were, were perfect for us. And, uh, you know, we, we shot them at a, a very deep stop um, almost always, like, you know, F8, F11, mm -hmm. you know, really. and uh, the other thing that, that that was an important part of our toolkit was the uh, was a polarizer that, that we used to darken the, the, the sky and, and the water. It was very effective when shooting on a boat. Um, right. So, yeah. yeah, there's... Um, a question um, with these lenses being a, a full fat, a full format, excuse me, uh, lens illumination. How did how did that work for you? How did you feel about that using it on the smaller Amira sensor? I mean, you know that yeah, it works great on the Super Thirty Five. I mean, that's you know it's not using the, the full potential of it, but it's using the, the sweet spot of the the lens, right? And and uh, yeah, it, it it worked perfectly. Did you feel hampered by it at all, or was that chosen for that specific reason? I wouldn't say that it was chosen for that specific reason, but certainly not hampered by it. Um, awesome. Yeah. And that it's worked out well for you. Very, yeah. Yeah. Lightweight and 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 uh, you know, not cumbersome. They're they're very. Well, well, they were really really working very well, and as a yeah. Jack, Jack said, you know they, you know. We mostly shot on 15 to 30, and but when we wanted to go either to a tighter close up or we were shooting from the boat towards the island and we needed to be a little tighter, you know, we changed, but that change was maybe like five minute 
change with, you know, just uh, Jack and then the first AC, you know, kind of working. Mm -hmm. was, uh, so I, I found that, that, you know, it was very efficient. And because we knew we didn't want to have any really longer lens than 80, uh, it was not storage driven to be that voyeuristic, you know? Um, right. Um, I mean, that it just was a really, the, the lenses worked very well. And, you know, the, the really images came out really beautifully and clean and, uh, you know, and sharp, but not too sharp. So the, 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 there was actually, you know, a perfect choice. That's, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, no, you can really see that, you know, like you said, you get the best part of the, the lens there, you're shooting, you know, on a smaller, on a smaller sensor. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of clarity to the images that you've gotten. And uh, going back to what we were talking about before, what I mentioned, it, it, it again gives us that ability to kind of compose or, or the, the emotion or what the, the, the sailors are experiencing for ourselves. That's right. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, just to, to mention, the film was shot, it is a documentary film because it's unscripted. But it's also not a documentary because it was shot in a very narrative way. We basically set up the camera, we set up the wide shot, we set up the overs, we set up the close-ups. We film, you know, basically over and over and over the same stories. And I prepared the uh, sailors, my characters, for that, I told them that they would have to do this over and over again so I can pick the good takes and I could get the coverage. But being static and being much more narrative in a language, camera language and the cinematic language, I think it kind of blends the documentary with narrative in a very interesting way and uh, adds poetry to the character, you know, and um, also filming with the longer takes allows, you know, us to kind of uh, not rush because the statement, because we can always cut to something else. And, um, you know, and on the island, as um, Jack said, you know, the landscape was more, kind of more important to see the people in the landscape than being with the people. Right. Right, excellent. Um, I, a question from Emily in our Q&A um, um, on the screen is, and we've answered a couple of this, but what, what was the choice for black and white? Um, we we talked about the the lenses, but yeah, why why stay why why black and white instead of color? In my opinion, it was just again uh, an obvious choice that came from aesthetics. But you know, to kind of explain um, verbally what I felt emotionally, I would say that taking away the color stripped. Uh, the information, you are able to more concentrate on characters and also taking away the color. I think I, here's one thing I ask, for example, this uh, character Ray that we were talking about, do you dream in colors? And he said, no, I don't dream in colors. I, the, colors for me are an abstract thing. I don't know what colors look like. So right. I think black and white was more appropriate that way to the way my characters will see, though uh, another character says that when she closes her eyes, she sees colors like she never seen them before when she was sighted. So, <laughs> you know, uh, Maybe I don't it's know best if it's the right answer, but emotionally, I mean, it, it's interesting because and from time to time during the editing process, I would look at the footage and the black and white layer, correction layer would be gone. And suddenly like I saw my movie in color and I scream you know, <laughs> in pain. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you know, it, it definitely does well to kind of drive more of a mental uh, presentation, you know, to strip away, you know, any any thoughts that might be that way. I thought that was yeah, an interesting choice, certainly. So where um, what is your plans with the, the, the piece now? Where can people see it or where can they plan to see it in the future? Well, uh, right now, um, I sign up with a company in England called um, a Film, uh, I forgot the name, sorry about, but they are guiding uh, me through the process of submitting the film to the festivals. So hopefully the visibility will, uh, of the film, the film will start to live there and, uh, you know, kind of see its audience. I'm planning also some uh, uh, screenings in Los Angeles and later on in the summer in Portland for the blind community up there because uh, uh, they were uh, they were kind of very helpful in uh, organizing and have bringing me the people that you know basically are on the screen. Uh, they helped me find them. Uh, there. Wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. The, by the way, the film was uh, shot in Maine, out of Port, out of Camden, and uh, we yep. found some amazing locations within a three and a half hours of sail that just uh, were stunning. No, it's certainly a beautiful backdrop and a terrific sailing vessel, I might add. Um, it makes me mourn for the one I owned a few years ago. <laughs> Jack and Yasek, thank you for your time today. Um, and uh, we're glad to have you here and talk about this, this great piece. We'll look for it on the festival circuit uh, in the new year. Um, and we'll uh, make sure to, to, to get it out there and get the word out as well. And anyone who wants to rewatch this or wants, if you want to share it with friends, we will be recorded um, and we'll put it on our YouTube page uh, by name of Zeiss Lenses Americas. And you can come watch more of it there. Jack Yasek, again, thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you, Tony. Look... Thank you, Anna, for organizing this. And it was a pleasure. And hopefully it will, uh, you know, kind of uh, bring the film to be better understood. And then, uh, you know, please do watch it. Uh, we would like you to see it and experience a different way of uh, living life. Wonderful. Thank you both for your time and look forward to seeing more. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.